Hi, my name is Dave. Today I'd like to show you the beautiful, elegant Atlas 60 by 900 telescope from the early 1950s. Can you pick out the swan amongst all these ordinary ducks? Look at the long, graceful lines of the Atlas. The beautiful fluidity of it compared to these other really ordinary mundane telescopes from the same period on similar mounts. I think you can see that the Atlas has a much more aesthetic appeal to it. This thing is beautiful. I'll be showing you some close-ups of the elegant lines on this thing, the fluid, the flow, the... Oh, now I'm not saying it's functional. You know I like a telescope that's quirky, so I would love this telescope simply for its odd, strange quirkiness. But there is much more than that going on here. Let me give you a look at this thing, show you how it works. One thing that you will notice right away is that this mount is not balanced. It wants to go, whoa, it wants to go that way, or it wants to go this way. Look at that. It's not balanced about the center of gravity here, which is very atypical. A normal mount would have the axis going right about through here. Here's a close-up look at this mount. It has a friction device there which is practically uh, unnecessary. Now it's got two things here, two knobs. One, this one here is basically kind of a friction control. Um, this one on the other side is more or less a lock. Now you can lock it down. This is squeezing that nice and tight, so it really becomes quite rigid. But if you really wanted to operate the telescope in a practical way, probably the best thing to do would be something like that. So that it now moves. You can lock it down if you want to, but you're never going to lock it down if you're looking at an astronomical object for any length of time. So you're going to kind of loosen this, Keep the friction pretty tight over here, and it still has the tendency <laughs> to want to do that. Uh, <laughs> this thing is, uh, in physics, we would call this a metastable situation. It, it really doesn't want to stay in that particular position. Take a look at this just beautiful little finder. And one of the most unusual things here is that the find this is all part of the same casting. The whole focuser here and the finder mount is all one casting. And the lines on the finder are also beautiful. Uh, and it's got a really nice, delicate little crosshair in there. It's, uh, <laughs> I think, maybe 20, 25 millimeters, something like that. So it's maybe a 5 by 25. Uh, here is the focuser. The focuser actually works pretty darn well. It's actually optically pretty good. Look at me, I'm still trying to have to balance the thing every time I move it. But isn't that beautiful? This diagonal is, um, I th think you can see that this has got a taper to it. That tapers down. Uh, and some of the other scopes online maybe have different brands like uh, Palomar and I think there's another brand anyway but it's the, basically the same scope however they have different systems here 
This thing, this eyepiece is actually a 965 eyepiece. In order to remove this diagonal, the diagonal is fixed and attached to that tapered piece. You have to unscrew the darn thing. And I have seen other scopes. Now this thing is going to take off on me the minute I let it go. <laughs> See? So I'm locking it down. Jeez. Okay, so there you have that. Notice this like strange taper here. Here are the eyepieces from this scope. They have an unusual indentation here. And the indentation fits the solar filter. How is that for bizarre? Other scopes of this, made by the same manufacturer, clearly identical but with different names on them, have a similar thing, even though the eyepiece size might be different. Um, they're also marked, pretty sure you can probably make this up, 50x60, so that's a 50 power eyepiece. They don't give you the focal length. One of the reasons this telescope has such nice long lines, it could easily be confused with a um, 60 millimeter F18 or maybe F20 is because this tube, this piece of tube here is the same diameter as this piece of tube. Here's a nice little cap there. And then screw this. The objective cell, the objective cell can be removed here and actually could be flipped. This is another very unusual feature of this telescope. Uh, the tube goes down from whatever this is, probably 70, 75 millimeters, and steps down to maybe 50, 60 millimeters here, probably 50. Anyway, it steps down with this kind of a device here. Very unusual, uncommon, and not seen in very many scopes at all. Take a close look at the proportions of this mount. This thing is much longer uh, and elegant, more elegant, more narrower than it would be on another telescope. As a matter of fact, if you just moved these, this axis up to here, the scope wouldn't fit in between here. There's structure in there that would not allow the scope itself to fit. Anyway, this thing is long, elegant, beautiful, aesthetically, uh, uh, piece of sculpture that I admire greatly. You can see that this housing here has a couple of bolts that tighten this down. Those bolts are not meant to be adjusted. You're meant to put the telescope in one place, um, balance it and for whatever it's worth. And if you make slight changes to it, like adding or subtracting eyepieces, uh, you're just kind of going to have to use the friction control to uh, deal with that. These bolts are more or less permanent. You can loosen those and slide the two back and forth in there, but it's not designed to be have that done on a regular basis. I hope you've enjoyed having a look at the beautiful, elegant Atlas 60 by 800 telescope from the early 1950s. Thank you for watching. <laughs>